Why the world didn't end yesterday. December 22nd, 2012. If you're watching this video, it means one thing. The world didn't end yesterday. Look around you. The whole thing was a misconception from the very beginning. Those copper petals are now alive. And are the cauldron of the London 2012 days. In a very different way. Not removed by occupation. The was made in an ITV documentary screen last Wednesday that alleged that Jimmy Savile was guilty of the sexual abuse of underage girls. Been murdered. And the none of these officers, no the justice system, the successful. politicians, nobody cared. People seem to think I may have moved on and I've got over Stephen Stick. I haven't. And this is not just about making the UK a more hostile place for illegal migrants, it is also about fairness. Um, at the start of 2012, I was what was called an associate tutor at the University of Sussex. And I was trying to bring in my research, my research on black and South Asian artists in the 80s, into my teaching as much as I could. Came to the realisation, probably a bit late, that, um, that I needed to make a change. I uh, applied and got a new job based at Tate Britain, working as the Henry Moore Foundation Research Fellow, cataloguing the Tate's Henry Moore Sculpture Collection. Small loan work, some work from paper in here as well, but the art collection, and then um, the social history collection as well. So. Wow. These are the archives that I use mainly. This is the archive from the 1980s that I'm currently working on. This exhibition, Step Into the Arena, initially um, it had been suggested that the show would be um, a joint show with uh, Donald Rodney. And so we have, even though it's not part of the Keith Piper exhibition in this folder, we have these amazing uh, cards that Donald Rodney created for the gallery or show the curators his thinking about what he might include in the show. It's just incredible to find and completely unexpected when I opened a file on Keith Piper. <laughs> so you have these hidden gems as, a, as somebody who works in the archive and you get to see amazing work that, I, that doesn't survive. Yayo Kusama at Tate Modern is the blockbuster exhibition of 2012 that for me signals a moment. The exhibition notes on the Tate website are an interesting testament to where we were at the time. The notes are informative, respectful, yet subtly othering. Again it feels like we're on the cusp of something. Terminology such as neurodivergent, 
is still not fully embraced in art establishment showing spaces. But that from my perspective, the middle and later years of this decade is when neurodivergence really begins to break through. Where was I in 2012? I was on the cusp of becoming a digital native. It was that sudden revelation that um, online platforms could give you that power. You know, it was sort of the democrat. It felt like a democratization of space and a way of very easily connecting to people who you could, you know, really relate to in ways that hadn't been possible in real life. So. In 2012, there were just a handful of us artists um, online. We hooked up very spontaneously. And I began, I think I began an artist um, page on Facebook in 2012 or thereabouts. And that was, that was an important way of connecting. There, were, there was also the, um, the AN blogging platform at that point. And I also used WordPress. So in 2012, I was using a WordPress blog and somehow all these spaces were held together by Twitter and Facebook. And at that point, my identity really was as a mother of a neurodivergent child. And I had been doing a lot of research from that perspective. And then it was later on that having found community, I began to realize and unpick my own identity. Uh, that was done in 1717. There's a Latin date at the end, and um, it basically says this is the school was uh, 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 set up by the Anglican Church to teach children, destitute children, uh, in the principles of the Anglican Church. Mm -hmm. 1717. That's what it was. It was it was a, a school for orphans, for poor children, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's, it, the, you got this this curious mix of the philanthropy and and exploitation schools the church sponsored it the church was over there mm. but the people who put the money in were all merchants and most of them were involved in some way in the slave trade yeah i actually consulted my diaries which i thought would be quite an interesting way of of thinking about 2012 and i did i did lots of interesting things but it's probably about the last time i sort of traveled I, I, I traveled a bit to vancouver and cologne and places and i haven't i don't think i've been on an airplane since so that says something about how climate change has impacted on my ethical position. But I do think that, that uh, for me, in a sense, 2008 was probably more of a watershed sort of moment because there was the economic crash and there was the uh, Occupy movement and all these sort of things. And um, I think they were still having resonances four years later. And I've, I've sort of thought about this, that looking at our program and um, thinking about the things that I was, I was doing because I was then artistic director of the whole centre with, with a very good curator called Sarah Jane Parsons who was bringing in some really interesting shows. But I think in 2008 we were sort of protected in a sense from the crash because we'd just opened with a, with a 14.5.75 million pound development, new building, European capital of culture, Liverpool was. It was a lot of optimism and, and we opened with a, you know, it was a very good time for us. Four years later, you know, that fund, the funding cuts were really starting to hit because we were protected for a couple of years with an enhanced outskirts of funding, which then stopped. So we had to, you know, just curtail some of our programmes, which were going very well, like the literature programme, the music programme, the dance programme. We had to sort of stop most of that and lay people off. So it was not a very happy time in terms of the promise we thought was there in 2008 by then it sort of dissipated a bit and the reality of, of economic crash and then con growing concerns about everything really. So let's have a look. Um, I've got the, I've got that over there, Unexpected Guests, I've got that one. That's the biennial, that's with John Acomfra. Um, so we've got here, we've got that one, difference on display. Um, which became neat normal. That I've got over there, human craft. That's the Gina Zanecki, yes. and we could talk about that perhaps oh. in relation to some of the um, what's been happening with quarantine and quarantine and uh, 
infection, viruses. This is the garden. Uh, although we haven't had any sculpture exhibitions at the moment, there's actually an, an art trail, which is an interactive art trail uh, by our learning dis disabilities group called Blue Room. So as you go around, there's different things that you can use your phone to interact with. So it's, I think it's, it's here. This is the, it's called the Invisible Blue Island, and um, it's only just opened. There's a lot you can do. It looks really engaging. This is why sculptors live and work alone. I literally just ground around it like that. But I just playing around with this idea east and west so these two pieces might go together yes there's a sense of this is from the south this is from the north then there's east and then there's west sort of written into it and just two two bits that connect a little bit about connection well that was a commission but it was a definite commission for channel 4 telly This is the sort of pitch that I made to Channel 4. This is in July 2011. So you've got to show some work. And then sort of, this is Myron's uh, Discobolus. And then this is the ubiquitous wheelchair logo. So sort of try to explain how that would work. They'd had designs on that big four uh, earlier, and it's such a wonderful, uh, iconic thing. But it only looks like a four when you look at it straight ahead. When you go around the side, it's all different angles, which is uh, which I found really fascinating as a sculptor, because when you look at it from the side or the back, it's quite abstract, and it's only when you doom, sing it into place that it suddenly all the bits that I wanted, so the wheel of the wheelchair, you know, it's a very corny idea in many respects, you know, it's a discus, you know, somebody throwing a discus, uh, which was based on Myron's Greek sculpture called Discobolus. So it re I wanted it to relate to the original Olympic Games, so right back in history. But also we got this, this sort of ubiquitous wheelchair logo that signifies disability and of course only something like five percent of disabled people use wheelchairs but this logo this very simple stick logo is everywhere in the world it's instantly recognizable even though it doesn't really represent disabled people we're not a homogenous group so i wanted to use that in a kind of signifying way and i wanted the wheel to be in neon to give a sense of dynamism I guess and then the uprights again really corny gold silver and bronze upright so and this is the render this is CAD it's not the real thing but these are the images that we use to give to Channel 4 this is the real thing whilst the sculpture was very overt the title of the sculpture which titles are really quite important for me is the monument to the unintended performer was kind of a quite subversive in that disabled people are always stirred at just going about our everyday business you know if somebody in a wheelchair gets on a bus everybody stirs the you know the the ramp if it works because often it doesn't and it makes this noise and then there's a disjointed voice saying you know wheelchair getting on a bus sort of thing everybody stirs at you so we are unintended performers in that sense and yet the Paralympians want people to stare at them you know they want to be objects of scrutiny so I wanted to play around with that paradox of staring not staring being watched not being watched um, which is what the title was about so some disabled people got that instantly oh I know what I've got you're asking about press this is the only press coverage apart from channel 4 
none of the art press covered it because they didn't really, I don't think they saw it as a work of art, they saw it as a Channel 4 thing. But this is, um, this is married to Jeskvi in the Independent and she just says, I haven't been very complimentary about public art in Britain. She thought this, uh, that my sculpture should go in the Olympic Park after, it, after the Olympics had finished. Two, 2012, I certainly remember as, as quite a, a transitional year. I remember it as a year of, of, of a lot of flux. There was a lot going on. I just left Tate in 2011 and I uh, was teaching at the Architectural Association and I also joined the Royal College of Art, the Curating Contemporary Art Programme in the summer of 2012. But I just remember also the background context. I, I know we're thinking about 2012, but 2011 just bled into 2012. There was Occupy movement, of course, going on in, in London at St Paul's. There was Liberate Tate uh, over at Tate Modern. Uh, there were student protests about the student loan arrangements, which really were, I think, quite a wake-up call for everyone. So I just remember, and there were, there were riots, there were things happening in Brixton and in my local area. So there was a lot going on in the background, I remember, but I also remember um, giving up smoking. I'm sure that seems very relevant uh, 10 years on, I remember it, but I, 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 I don't remember it because it was difficult, it was incredibly easy. But I, I remember it because it also marked a loss of a certain type of space um, for me and for conversations that I, I realised I really cherished. At, at Tate, I think everyone knew to find me in the car park. And you know, it was, it was always quite amusing that over the years, artists or curators or people would come in for meetings and say, do you want a cigarette? And, and what that was was, can we go and have a different type of conversation walking around? And I suppose I look back on that and think, it's where are those kind of spaces, those non-instrumentalised, non-task-based, non-meeting spaces? What, what have we done with architecture and design to create the spaces that we might want to, to talk about? So I think about that a lot still, 10 years on. Um, but also, quite memorably, I bought my first iPhone. I was slow and slightly resistant to join the iPhone cult, but of course, you know, I, I was converted straight away. Yes, 2012, I, I think for, for a lot of people, um, the exhibition that one would remember was Documenta. But it was a particular, been a lot of focus on, on this particular Documenta, which was curated by Carolyn Christoph Bakakiev. And it was around the theme of collapse and recovery. It was a very big Documenta. But it had also had uh, been staged and had events outside of Castle in um, the Banff, uh, and in, in Canada and in uh, Kabul and Cairo. And it had really picked up on the questions and conditions of global unrest and, and um, protests that had happened um, the previous year. So it really had that sense of urgency about the kind of political conflicts that were happening, um, m moment that happened outside the Friedrichshafen. And it was interesting that that was dealt with by, by the curatorial team, um, that it was rather than evicted or, or challenged, it was absorbed into the programme. And, and I think that was right, but I think it was also a turning point about how art was beginning to really take into account and had to take into account um, what was going on politically, socially, uh, culturally. Um, couldn't just comment from the side, but had to take it on. And, in the same way that when Liberate Tate um, took over the Turbine Hall. You know, these were moments of confrontation that needed real engagement with, to be taken seriously, not just to be managed. And, and I think that signalled a big change um, about ethics and care and curating. <laughs> Oh, this is quite interesting, Maud Salter. Um, Maud Salter is a, a, an amazing black, was an amazing black woman artist who worked at Rochdale Art Gallery. She curated a number of really important shows 
and she was an artist in her own right and a poet. So um, Hysteria was the name of uh, a series of poems and so this was a CD that was of her reading the poem. I think 2012 in some ways um, saw the fruition of a number of things that had happened a few years earlier. So a number of projects came to fruition in 2012, um, or actually the end of 2011. Late 2011, a show that was co-curated by Paul Goodwin and Labena Himid opened called Thin Black Lines. Um, so that ran from late 2011 to March 2012. And that show re-examined Labena Himid's curatorial work from the 1980s. And it included the work of black women artists, including Claudette Johnson, Shutupa Biswas, um, Sonia Boyce, Labena Himid and, and others. And, and as well as a whole array of archival material. So that was a really significant thing that happened. At the start of 2012, perhaps to coincide with that show, um, the exhibition Migrations, Journeys Through British Art opened at Tate Britain. That show was all about how artists who had migrated to Britain or who came from diasporic communities in Britain had shaped and contributed to um, a narrative of British art. And so it was a historic show and it had artists from the 19th century up to the 21st. Um, but it was really important because it included works by artists active in the 1980s, including Donald Rodney and Eddie Chambers and Keith Piper, um, John Acomphra. Um, and so it was a really significant to me to see that this institution called Tate Britain was engaging with, um, with the notions of who might be included in a narrative of British art and who might be identified as a British artist and explicitly stating that migrant artists had made significant contributions. Also at the Graves Gallery in Sheffield was an exhibition um, examining the work of the Black Art Group from the 1980s which included work by Marlene Smith, Claudette Johnson, Keith Piper, Donald Rodney. I think Eddie Chambers was in that show as well. Around the end of 2011 into 2012, there were things going on in terms of black art in Britain. And there was a, um, a, uh, a reflecting back to the 80s. Um, and that's partly to do with the fact that um, 2012 saw the anniversary of the 1982 First National Convention of Black Art which was staged at Wolverhampton um, Polytechnic in October 1982. That convention was a significant moment because it brought together art students who identified as black from across England and the UK to discuss the form, function and future of black art. 2012 was the anniversary of that event and in October 2012 um, the Black Art Research Group staged a conference at um, Wolverhampton University to reconsider the legacies of that event. The recordings of that conference are still available online so we can watch them and it's really interesting to see how many of the questions remain unresolved. I mean this question of who is a black artist and what is black art I think is a very one that the answers to those questions are very personal. The Unfinished Conversation takes its name from uh, a film by John Acromfer as part of the Liverpool Biennial at the Blue Coat, which was an amazing moment. And I think the fact that that work was shown at, at Blue Coat at that moment was really important because it flagged the Blue Coat centrality to um, diversifying narratives of British art. And then I think the other the other show which I think put down a sort of marker 
which I think uh, is still very important in relation to the last decade that we've gone through, uh, was the biennial. And um, the theme of that, that year, was, which was curated by Sally Talent, was um, it's called The Unexpected Guest. And I'll just read a little bit from the, from the brochure, because I think this is quite interesting. It says, in a globalising world, increasing mobility and interdependence are changing the rules of hospitality. There are different cultures of hospitality, often coexistent in the same place. Our awareness of such complexity and migration between nations and cultures makes clear distinctions between host and guest increasingly difficult. And haven't we just had that in the last sort of, you know, 10 years in terms of migrations and um, welcoming or not welcoming people? Hospitality. So it was, again, it was a sort of prescient um, theme. And at the Blue Coat, although it wasn't done, this, this, what we had was not done specifically for the biennial, but the main sh piece was John Acomfra's Unfinished Conversation, which was a three screen film piece. Professor Stuart Hall and myself have been working together for a very long time. Um, in reality, since 1991. And he was such a, you know, charismatic kind of communicator. And he was coming towards, you know, the end of his, his, his life, I thought. Um, it was clear his, his health was beginning to fail him on a lot of fronts. But in about 2002, 10 years before um, the actual first displaying of it, I met with um, my colleague at the time, Derek Bishton, and um, Catherine Hall, Stuart's partner and wife, and uh, Stuart in a cafe in Camden. And we were discussing this idea of how would we begin to tell his story uh, and his engagement with the visual arts, but not as a kind of straight story, if you like, not as a linear story, but as someone who drifted in and out of communications and visual studies and semiotics and an incredible you know academic cultural studies life which of course was the essence of what Stuart was about he was someone that understood the power of popular culture understood the power of images and uh, we discussed the possibility then of making a, a multi-channeled uh, visual narrative that gave Stuart the opportunity to unpack over a period of time, uh, his thoughts. So it was really about like the thought of Stuart Hall, but through the idea of film, but make something that was incredibly accessible, so that ideas about race and rights and identity politics could be unpacked, but predominantly through the lens of his own experience. That was the idea of this journey. John Acomfra had a very sympathetic kind of lens on Stuart's life and work as well. Um, and I think he was probably also thinking about the impact of Stuart's, of Stuart's world on his work. And we kind of came together and uh, we were able to uh, put together a substantial budget to, to, to make what was always going to be a three screen, multi channel gallery piece. It was never really meant for television, never really meant as a kind of documentary trope. It was always going to be an experiential piece. And um, at that time, it wasn't going to be part of the Liverpool Biennale. Brian had agreed that he would support that application, knowing the work of Watergraph over many years, knowing the work of John Acomfra over many years, and they negotiated the work being part of, or being shown in the Biennale. I think it was a gift to the Biennale in, in, from my perspective. I think they, they did very well. It became central, seminal. Um, Nick Sorota and Chris Durkon from, from Tate, all the people, it was the perfect moment. People were seeing it, people were talking about it. It created an excitement. It was clearly, of its time, a really important piece of work. It still is. I think it's still on a show at Tate as we speak now. Um, and it, 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 it hit a call. The, the Tate Encounters Project um, which was the first major research project that uh, Tate had undertaken as part of its new kind of university type status. It's, this was a project that had been funded by, by political initiatives, um, a program, a strategic program called Diaspora's Migration Identities. And over a four, four year period, a, a very long uh, 
uh, extensive research project. We were looking at three particular areas of question, which was why, fundamentally, the demographic of uh, Tate's audiences had, it had not changed in terms of black minority ethnic um, and was stuck at about 3 to 4 percent. And one of the things that our findings highlighted out of kind of three major areas was that by targeting programs and targeting exhibitions at a particular demographic only reproduced the conditions of cultural difference, of kind of ghettoization. We also discovered from our participants that, that they were less interested in questions of identity, but much more um, about how the museum connected with their everyday. And that again was driven by the rise in mobile technology and, and, and network culture. And the third thing that became apparent very clearly was they wanted to understand how this assumed cultural value of the museum, how its curatorial expertise made decisions. They wanted to understand the workings of the museum. And, and I think that was much more about the move from looking at art objects to, to process-based um, ways of, of, of engaging. I told you, I, I don't know much about artists working, and I'm just trying to learn. But it's the can... feeling, it's the feeling. How does this painting make you feel? Those findings really highlighted the impact of digital technology, not only on visitors and participants coming um, to the museum, but also on how the museum was perhaps underestimating or misrecognizing the impact of technology. It was still thinking of digital technology as a tool, as, as a way of publishing. It was still thinking about what we call the broadcast mode, the one to many. So it was a monolithic hierarchical institution. And I think the Tate Tanks opening in uh, 2012 um, was, was an opportunity that Tate did take up. I think it was a 12 or 15 week program called Art in Action. And, and that really tried to um, follow visitors and audiences. There were, there were a mixture of programs. There was a move to performance, much more use of digital technology, uh, events, um, rather than any object-based um, you know, conventional modernist staging. And I think Chris Dirk and the then director at Tate Modern, you know, in press releases and I think in interviews, he started to say, you know, the new museum in the 21st century needs to be thought of as a medium. I think that was quite a radical idea for Tate. I think it most probably is still a radical idea. I think it's very hard for a museum structure formed in the 19th century, however much it's changed, to recognise its function as one of just mediating rather than um, broadcasting. Yeah, Unlimited really started in about 2010. Or I think maybe we already knew that we got the Olympic Games and Paralympics. And the Arts Council, uh, London Councils, uh, came to me when I was Chief Executive at SHAPE and said, would you commission some work by disabled artists, performance type work? And we commissioned five or four, I think four artists to make some work that we put on over a bank holiday weekend on the South Bank as part of it. So we, we commissioned four artists based around this and we commissioned a deaf filmmaker called Sam Dorr to document it, which was great because then we had documentary evidence and that became the sort of experiment if you like for unlimited so we were encouraged to put in a funding application with shape as the lead partner arts admin as the production side of things and we invited joe verentin as our senior to act as senior producer and it was very democratic how we did everything all the decision making we brought together a group of people to evaluate and and it basically the commissioning process and what we wanted was for the majority of that money from the Arts Council, the British Council and the Spirit of 2012 and LOCOG to go directly to funding the artists and their production of their work. 
and I think it was fantastic success. So that was a great piece of legacy and Shapers managed Unlimited for the next sort of 10 years and now it sailed off as a fully formed and hopefully, you know, wonderfully established uh, commissioning process which will continue. And again, Shape has done this over 45 years, which has come up with really great models and then kind of unleash them and let them get on with it. And one of the things that the Arts Council are being pushed to do by DCMS is to fund, to spend more funding outside of London. So it made complete sense for Unlimited to not be based in London. Oh, hang on, these ones. I'm not sure they're in this box. I think these ones belong in this box. I think it's possible to talk about the Museum of Everything exhibition in Selfridges 2011 as being on the coattails of our decade and the Project Artworks States and Spaces exhibition at the Milton Keynes Gallery just overlapping by a few days into 2012 as a tipping over the, at the cusp of something new. I first started going on Twitter to research an artist, funnily enough. And I came across an artist called John Adams. From May 2012 until June 2013, John Adams held a post as the artist in residence at the Autism Research Centre at the University of Cambridge. And I followed John online. He was one of the first people I followed online. And I was absolutely fascinated and at that point I wasn't diagnosed and um, he also had made works around his school experiences of dyslexia and I remember in particular seeing um, an exhibition with, a, with, with all these objects that he'd kept uh, in cabinets and a pen which he'd put pins into <laughs> <laughs> relating to his experience of, with writing and dyslexia. And that was like, oh, wow. That's a, that, that was a real light bulb moment for me. And um, John's example was very important to me, but I think he was probably the only person that I knew of at that point who was practicing in this way. Whereas now you will see many people, in fact, you know, there's, there's so many, I've lost count, uh, and I think actually somebody needs to survey this. The publication of Neurotribes, a seminal work by US writer Steve Silberman in 2015, changed everything in my view. It was four years in the writing, I believe. It's a historical rewriting of autistic history and in many ways its ascendancy to bestseller status and the awards conferred on it gave the mainstream access to the concepts and rational underpinning of the neurodiversity paradigm. But I think what's happening now is that more people are aware of themselves, more organisations are seeking funding to work with autistic and neurodivergent creatives, so to support mentoring, you know, to mentoring and support for curatorial practice, artistic practice. So it's being, in some respects, it's being nurtured by the sector through imperatives for funding this kind of work and more awareness. And then it's also spilling out because neurodivergence is now embracing many other categories of people. You now have um, people like Jade French, who's um, uh, a researcher. She works with groups of learning disabled curators and she is developing a pedagogy around art schools, accessibility and sort of making um, the sector aware of this intellectual ableism that exists that has kept people out of curation. For me, in a way, when a category becomes so all-embracing, it has a great positive in that you are greater in number and you can show solidarity, and there's a feeling of collectivism, but you also lose something. And what you lose is the specificity of the lived experience, 
and you lose the ability to talk um, uh, with precision sometimes around access needs. Yeah, in, in 2012 you've got these um, several exhibitions that, are, that are, again, it's back to this idea of lines of inquiry. Um, and one is called Neat, Neat Normal, which is a show which somebody called Ina Havers, a, a Dutch curator, had shown in Amsterdam, I think, the year before. And there's an organisation in Bluecoat who we've been quite involved in for many years called um, Dada Fest, which is Deaf and uh, Deaf and Disability Arts Festival. And they do a festival every year. And for this year, they, they, they worked with um, Ina to do this, bring this show to Europe, uh, to, to Liverpool. And um, it was a very strong show. It had some sort of main artists, big artists like Douglas Gordon, Bruce Nauman, and some disabled artists in it. But, and I think that for us, in, in retrospect, that was probably the, an issue for us because we were in an organisation that had, um, part of the reason we'd done this big development was to make the building accessible, physically accessible. And it meant that Dada Fest, when they, when they moved in, they were one of the first tenants. So we always had a responsibility to, to sort of be a bit more critical about that, how we worked with, how we presented disabled artists. And so we worked again with Dada Fest um, two years later. And we did a, a, our own show, which was called Art of the Lived Experiment, collaboration with Dada Fest, who appointed uh, Aaron Williamson, who's a disabled artist, does a lot of performance work, very powerful stuff. He was the curator. So we worked together with, with Aaron, Dada Fest Blue Coat to do a show called Art of the Lived Experiment, which was 100% disabled artists. And I think it was a much stronger show. I mean, you could say bigger names were in the previous show, but this was um, a lot of grassroots work, a lot of performance work, quite a lot of edgy work. We didn't know if it was going to work and stuff, but I thought it was a very strong, strong show. So it's the first sculpture to go on the Liverpool plinth. And this, this is... Uh, installation of it. It goes on the Liverpool plinth for a year, so it was great unveiling by the mayor. So it is, it's down near the pier head, this is the liver, famous liver buildings. So this is a kind of weird point of sale and, and David Heavey wanted to use the younger me and this is the red charity collecting tins getting knocked over by this prosthetic leg. I think what the archive wants to do is to highlight work that we think is important work. And then the institutions like Tate or the National Gallery or whoever it is can look at that work and see it in the National Archive. And then the curators can look and think, OK, that's interesting work. Because often they won't understand some of the stories behind the work. And that's part of the issue for curators, isn't it? Understanding the nature of the work. You know, when we look at, at um, marginalised groups or discrimination in Britain, you know, the archive becomes a really important place to look. The lessons that the feminists of the 1970s taught us about the way that patriarchal structures um, inform what's classified and deemed as art. Men do fine art, painting and sculpture, and women and artists of colour do community engagement projects. Maybe things that might be classified as craft, because they're not in the studio Monday to Friday painting they don't have a sustained artistic career. In her essay, there have always been great black women artists that Shyla Berman, Shyla Kamari Berman wrote in about 1986. She talks about the fact that black women artists could only get funding to support their work if they included some form of community engagement because that's how the Arts Council or whoever the funding body was perceived their value. So, and I think that's, persist that's persistent and has 
that continues. You, I mean, as an art historian, you, you, you go to the texts that are published by mainstream publishers or academic pub, and there's a time lag. It's changed in the last couple of years because there have been a, a number of really significant solo exhibitions that have been accompanied by major publications and monographs on individual artists. But in terms of um, integrating a narrative of black British art from the 80s and 90s into a broader picture of 20, late 20th century British art, that story hasn't been written. That's, that narrative hasn't been published as a book that's easily accessible. In my understanding, uh, a, a small regional public gallery like Touchstones Rochdale will have some funds from Arts Council or local government, local council, to acquire, acquire work. But that annual budget is tiny. A few years ago, the gallery did receive funding from the Art Fund to help fill in some of the gaps of its collection and they acquired work by um, Shutapa Biswas. So in, if they want to acquire work, it might be a what's called a commission to acquire. And the problem I find with um, showing work as an autistic person and having that as an identity, which might be a reason for people to view my work or come and see my work, is that moment of judgment. Until we can get away from that misperception, until autism becomes something that is really properly understood as human, <laughs> another way of being human, it's going to be it, it, it's going to be an issue, I think. The film that I made for the WayWav Commission is a very good demonstration of that withholding of uh, eye contact, withholding of uh, my identity, any markers of my identity other than my movement and my shoes. Um, and, and by presenting the floorscape, I'm in control of what is seen and what's perceived. But, but I think that's an excellent question about what happens to this work. And I do have physical work. I do have work that's um, been shown in real life. I do have work that, you know, has been sold and acquired. But it's, it's rare that that happens. And since the pandemic, I'm far more interested in developing online. And I think, it, I think these things do need to be collected and archived. We, you know, we are living in a culture that outside of our institutions is extremely interdisciplinary, if not transdisciplinary. You know, culture is not being formed in the same spaces and places as the 1890s and the art school, the university system and the museum are not reflecting how knowledge is being made outside of them. It's chasing. It, it's a big ask for institutions and particularly museums to value audiences equivalent to or more than its collection. And because of the way um, museums think about their audiences and segmentation and a kind of hierarchy of needs still. It's still like high art, low art. There's still an invisible, hidden assumption that there are categories of what is art and what is not art. And, and that's such a collapsed category. And in a way, does it matter if, it, you know, outside of the acquisition pool, you know, what matters is whether the museum is still a place of relevance and significance, you know, in, in, the, in the here and now. Of course, it has a duty to protect what it has acquired with the nation's money on behalf of the nation. But if the nation is changing, you know, and, and it's also about future, future nation, then 
understanding what, what the nation is and wants and, and including its representation in, in the dynamics, you know, has to happen. And I think, you know, just on the final thing, that, you know, I think it was, you know, it, it was Boris Groys who, who said, you know, and I think the museum hasn't quite recognised this, that with the, with the internet, you know, the internet has rendered the museum as the archive, you know, because now the internet, you know, is the collector. And, and, and I think that leaves the museum in a very uncertain place. But I believe in the museum, and I, I care passionately about the art museum, but I, I, I think it can afford to take so many more risks and have confidence to critically reflect um, with others. You know, it's, um, but the pressure on funding, I think, pe keeps everyone focused on old ways of doing things. I mean, the art scene is what it is. It's you know, there's 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 the, um, a commercial centre which is in London, and that that ain't going to change. Um, I think the regions have always struggled to create a market, certainly. For, I don't know what the reasons are, but even you know, successful international art cities like Glasgow, you know, it's not a very not in the sense as commercial as as perhaps it might be. If you look at other European cities where you've got a more federal system like in, 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 in Germany, you, know, you don't need to be in Berlin to buy art, you can buy art and it's, there's a much livelier market in Dusseldorf or Cologne etc. We haven't got that decentralised model of, a, of an art, commercial art market and of course the market drives the, the, the discourse in many ways. But I suppose what, what's always encouraged me is, has been, you know, as somebody who's worked in the regions all my working career, um, is the, the value of, of nurturing a local um, scene and the word local is always problematic you know it always seemed to be um, second class you know you, you, local is very parochial provincial I, I think that changed i think it's changed a lot over the last six or ten years partly because of digital because artists can now move quite easily between continents because they just do it digitally um and also i think there's more that sense of the sort of solidarity of um of that practice that, that the issues that we've been you know, Looking at in terms of Black Lives Matter or those inclusion inclusion issues, they're not they're not UK, they're they're international issues, and so I think there's a much more of that sort of sense of solidarity amongst artists, and there's you know really interesting networks that happen, and I quite like that that we're seeing a lot more now of these artist to artist um, collaborations. I heard about one recently with I think someone like Todmorden, which is in you know, Lancashire, uh, potentially doing a project with Great Yarmouth in in um, Norfolk. So you've got these ones that are happening and not not in the in the in the they're off off, off the mainstream off the main the mainstream as it were outside the mainstream so I, I do think that is that's happened a lot certainly there's a growth of that in Liverpool with groups like the Royal Standard and studio groups that are, have got good connections with uh, international partners um, and often the galleries aren't part of that they don't need to be part of it because they, they, there's, there's an ecology that exists out, outside of that which I think is healthy that's, that's Beef Art here, in, in, that's him in the building. Oh. Uh, but there's this lovely bit of film, which I'm going to show you, a very short film, um, called Beef Art on the Beach. This band recreated uh, a famous gig that Beef Art did in Cannes. Ladies and gentlemen, Beef Art on the Beach. It wasn't actually on the beach because the beach was there, it was too complicated. So they, they did it on the bandstand.